Hi, everybody. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, and welcome. These are artist talks that I've hosted. Uh, we're at about our 20th talk. We do these once a week. We do it every Tuesday, mm -hmm. 6 to 7, and they're virtual. They're via Zoom. Tonight, we have Linda Trala, who's going to present on her art. First, I do want to thank Michael Krasowitz. He'll be sharing screen with images. And as well, we have Mo Kelly, um, Mo Nolan, who is a model. You'll see her on two or three different screens. And part of the ideas I've expressed before is, if you like, you can both try and draw and listen and speak and see if it feeds each other. It's obviously quite complicated to do, as simple as it makes sound. But I found that if I zone in right to my drawing, I listen better and it does inform me. Um, and if on the other hand, I'm not drawing in a conscious way, I find I can't hear what the speaker is saying. So if you like, join in the experiment. Uh, keep in mind, um, I'm happy to uh, show anybody's drawings that they do from these presentations on my website, sort of under the artist talk section uh, that we do. Uh, I do have Bonnie Leibowitz will be speaking next week. And the week after Deanna Dawn will speak on three different topics. She won't focus on her own art, but on topics of interest, including uh, waste in the art world and some other various interesting topics that should be fun. Um, Linda, thank you for taking your time and thank everybody for their time for coming and also for your mental space, which is really our most valuable real estate. Uh, Linda, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I don't do much of an introduction of the artist. Um, feel free to share and discuss anything you like. And of course, just ask Michael to go to the next uh, slide whenever you like. So thank you, Linda, and thanks for coming. Okay, next slide. <laughs> All right, so Michael will share screen. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing the uh, the, the screen now? Not okay. yet. Not yet. Hmm. It's not letting me share screen now. Um, let's see. Do you want to go off and on and come on again, Michael? <clears throat> am, am I on now? I, as far as I know, am I on now? Yeah, well, I mean, you're on, but not sharing screen. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just pressing sharing screen and it's not letting me, uh, it's not doing anything. All right, so what I'll do, I do have it up on mine. Let me do my share screen. Let's see. Let's see if I can do this. Bear with us. I realize I used to always say, we always have technical difficulties. I stopped saying that and that's what happened here. Oh, wait, 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 I got it, I got it, hold on. Should I, should I should be able to do it. Hang on. Okay. Nice to see many familiar faces. Nice to see you, Olga and David. Yep, that's working. Okay. That's it. Just go a little larger if you can. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Good. All right. We'll, we'll run with that. We'll run with that. Yeah, the thing is, I don't know how to get exactly how to get to the next image. I'm just going to click on it and see if it moves me. Let's see. Yeah, I was fine before, but once I went to this thing, it seems like it's just showing the one image. Right. Um, so I would have to go out of this uh, to go figure out why it's not letting me go to the next image. Can you give me a second? Sure, sure. Take your time. Linda, do you just want to start with a little background information on yeah, this? Is, I planned to say with this picture. So um, tonight, uh, hello. I see some familiar faces and I'm happy to meet with other artists from other areas. And I would like to introduce you to my show, Self Power, Self Play, 50 Years of Erotic Portraiture. Um, the title... <clears throat> evolved from meeting two curators, Emily Scheuer and Emily Alessandro, um, who found a collection of mine of uh, my self-portraits at Bryn Mawr College that's been waiting to be exhibited. And um, they had the opportunity to um, also come over to my studio here and to look through my work. And we, aimed at maybe an exhibition called self-portraiting. 
And one of the curators um, also works at the Museum of Sex. And as it evolved to have a show at the Museum of Sex, we decided that we need to look at a more broader picture of what I've done. So this uh, work now is beyond my self portraits, but I've been photographing women in two books. And um, so the show um, is a mixture of uh, um, the moods, visual connotations, certain book collections, and it's not a narrative uh, presentation, it's a, it's a feeling. So we would get the next picture. There we go. So as you walk down the hall the, <clears throat> of the gallery, the first thing you see is um, Amanda Lepore. And she uh, was a fixture at the Chelsea Hotel and um, part of my New York photographing of women and my books. And next to that is my life at Chelsea Hotel, which was 20 years. And this is in 2000. And it's a picture of my then friend, uh, but now husband, Lota Troller, on my issued Chelsea Hotel bedspread with an Andreas Serrano picture of me above. Um, and I was pictured as the whipping, weeping woman. And in fact, I was weeping because my mother had passed. Next to that is a, a photograph of me in 1974 um, at the Ansel Adams workshops taken by David Bales. And below that is a photo by Lota uh, in 2004 at the Palm Beach workshops. And at the end is a portrait that Al <clears throat> Alana, Alana Kundi took um, for the Village Voice. And so pictures are clustered together. And so next picture. Okay, this is this extraordinary beautiful space. And you can see on the left side, it sort of begins with my earlier life, which was in black and white and <clears throat> includes portraits made of me and how I evolved. And um, on the other side are these clusters. And in the middle are um, wall hangings uh, and a full wall image. And then in the next room, it refers more to my pictures of other women and uh, of water. Next picture. So <clears throat> for this work, um, the most recent self-portrait was made this summer and um, it's the first one in the image here. And the second one is I took of Dragonfly for my book, Orgasm. And this is her strongest orgasm. And the next picture or floating silk is Emmanuel. And I photographed her in my Erotic Lives of Women book um, where she uh, showed her strongest orgasm with one with men and one with women. And so this is the feeling of the place. So the qu next question is, why would we make a story about me about my erotic portraiture? Um, because it's been really part of my life and in and, and developing very early. Um, so- um, I have to say, Linda, I, yeah, I was just I was just going to ask you the question sort of like that. So I really yeah, tell everybody else you're yeah. going to ask questions. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you actually asking the question of yourself. So thank you. Oh, okay. So um, yeah, you can interrupt me. I have a plan, but you can interrupt uh, with questions. So here we are. Next picture. So this is the backstory. Um, this is me in my youth, and um, I knew that my mother lacked fulfillment. My father was sexually compromised from World War II. I saw that when she was out of sorts with her body, she lost self-confidence. This loss of serenity was devastating to my mom in her prime, and observing this affected me. Now, my orgasm started around age three, when I pulled my pants down, when the little kids in my neighborhood did it together. And I, it was kind of shameful, but then I was very interested in it. And I 
wanted my girlfriends when they came over to touch me, quote, down there with shells. I was very interested in finding out about this sensation in my body. Next picture. So in my high school, um, I was queen of many dances and my dance teacher uh, proposed me to be Miss America and run for Miss New Jersey. And um, in these crownings and these events, I also had all this tingling going on. So people thought I was pretty photogenic and that, that, that gave me some sort of sensation. So um, what happened was, is that Bob Dylan and Joan Baez arrived on the scene just in time so that I did not try for that next picture. However, um, I wrote to see if I could be an assistant at the end, <clears throat> be an assistant at Ghost Ranch, which was the Presbyterian Summer Workshop Center and um, also the sometimes home of Georgia O'Keeffe. And I was accepted. And during the summer, uh, one of the directors gave me a camera and I just had it hanging around my, my neck when um, Georgia invited us to the official luncheon. And she saw me and she opened the port portico doors and said, go out and see, uh, see what the spirits tell you. And I had this two and a quarter Roloflex walking around. Um, and I found myself in a box canyon. And at this time in the seventies, we had burned our bras, so we weren't wearing bras, but I did take off my top. And so my first self portrait was something like this. And um, so next photo. These are on the wall at the gallery. Um, the next year um, I was in college and I applied to be an assistant at the Ansel Adams workshop. This would be the book bookmaking workshop with 40 students. And then I was asked to stay on if I could because one of the models was missing for the next workshop, which was called Nude in the Landscape. And you can see me up there. Um, the workshop was centered with Lucien Clerg, the very famous French photographer and Eiko Hosoi, the Japanese photographer. So I thought this was a great experience. And um, there is a picture in the show uh, that's not pictured here by David Broder, who I see is visiting uh, this Zoom tonight. Um, anyway, so next picture. So over the years, Lucien Clerg has photographed me whenever he came to America. And this is also on the wall at the gallery. Next picture. While we're, I was there, I was able also to take my own pictures uh, when I had a break. And this is called Homage to Tina Modati, 1974. And I love the magic between the um, pictures. I mean, between the bodies. So um, it's a little bit different doing it with next picture. Um, but anyway, during the nude workshop, I was crawling around on the floor in the smooth rocks, among the moss, uh, the moist earth, um, and it felt came very natural to me. And can I just say, can I just say the relationship between you and that rock on the left hand <laughs> side, it looks like it has knees, like that rock, it's just very powerful, your presence in this composition with that rock to the left of you. Oh, that's really, that, that actually is not my body, although her body is. Well, body. whoever's body it is. <laughs> she was another body, but it could fill in for my body. We were quite similar. Um, there is, yes, exactly. I I think I I nailed this one. You know, I was learning things there and, and I also I was learning to print very well. So when I returned, I was able to make a beautiful picture. Um, thank you for noticing that. It's one of my favorite early week pieces. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Well, then from there, um, I went back to college and um, I um, worked on a project which I called Greenhouse and Beyond. And I got objects and different things and I brought them to the greenhouse with models. And I wanted to explore uh, sexuality. 
And so next picture. So I brought a cut off wedding dress and my idea of ripping it off was uh, that I did not want to live the wife life. Maybe I was supposed to live. So um, with this model, when she stepped up there, I was like, oh, this, I gotta take this picture. This is, this is amazing. So um, this picture actually, the giant cactus stands above her, above, it's a signal of the dangerous path for women navigating among male curators, male lovers and male aggressors especially at this time in the 70s. Next picture. I was very excited that it was very quickly um, published in the Village Voice, which used to be a big, thick newspaper. And um, it really made a big noise. And then next picture, it was published in Heresies, which was one of the strongest women's rights journal magazines. And this um, took this picture and then my greenhouse and beyond further. All right, next picture. So listen, while all this is going on, um, I went through a tremendous breakup of an engagement. And we, we meaning some of my friends and all at this time, we were reading the Edward Weston day books and the, everybody went to Mexico. So I decided to go to Mexico and I went meet with Lenora Carrington who has since become very famous, but she was already a surrealist painter. And I was telling her about my life. And back then you made pilgrimages, you know, you got their address, or you knocked on the door. And she was wonderful to spend a day with me. And she said, Linda, you cannot be sad here in Mexico. We, we heal people. You can take the mushrooms or you can go to the waters. And so um, mushrooms, I knew nothing about that. I was not big on drugs. So. I went to the waters and for five days I soaked at San Jose Perua here and um, I let the toxins and the sadness drip into the water which the indigenous Mexicans told me about and um, this picture has been published many times because you know as as I went along in my career I stayed you'll see uh, on this water theme but I said to myself in making the self-portrait this is a topic for me. Next picture. So I began experimenting with sexuality and water. This is with one of my mother's like 1950s girdles in a sea cave uh, on the border of Italy and uh, France. Next picture. And I, you know, I experimented with masturbation feelings uh, in water. Next picture. This led me to this idea of following the waters more at spas beyond myself. And this is Harbin Hot Springs, which still exists. And these are yuppies and hippies all mingling together, learning about in the 90s, you know, this new idea of underwater massage. And this, these are all in the show. Next picture. Next picture. Next picture. So sometimes I photograph myself, sometimes I photograph people, other people in the water. This is a picture that I've had success with. Um, Willie Williams collected this for Haverford and other places. Um, I wanted one of my pictures to be about men and women in the water and I didn't want it to look like the Poconos, you know, <laughs> those shots. So I burned the slide and um, people like this. So it gave it a special feeling. Yeah, I, I'd agree. Obviously very different than your other work. Uh, I was going to ask how you got that effect, but uh, I think that's, you know, that's, I, I like your photo photography very much, what I've seen, but this is a standout in terms of experimentation. Yeah, you'll see in the book, there are a few others. So next picture. Again, you know, now I'm exploring the spa, the mud, different countries. I, I think I went to 25 different spa locations. And eventually, next picture, I came together in a, a book with Michael Sand as the editor at Aperture. And it's absolutely exquisite book. And um, it was the first kind of art book about, you know, we, we didn't have the internet that yet. So uh, about waters. 
and, and, and taking a look at it, not as old people crawling, you know, with their arthritic bodies into, into hoping for the future, which granted water can help, but I took a different artistic view. Next picture. So I carried on um, making pictures with water. They, these are all in the show. This was in 2017 when I was the master artist for 14 artists uh, at the Atlantic Center for the Arts. I made this picture and the next picture. And this is self-portrait. You see they're sort of blended together, but this is when I had a big show in Amsterdam and they gave me a room that had just a bathtub, a little bed, and all these mirrors. And I made this self-portrait there, um, looking at myself turning 60. It's a big day for me. Next picture. Linda, where did you learn your photography skills? Well, um, I had one, I had the only class at West Virginia University. Um, I had to switch from law into photography, into the journalism school. And then I applied to Syracuse University and I made my, my portfolio at the professional photographer's dark room that I sent up and I got in and I got my master's in photojournalism um, from Newhouse, but this didn't completely satisfy my views. So then I went on and uh, got an MFA from Syracuse University and became a photo professor at the beginning of my career. So I was capable of uh, editorial photography and art photography. And of course, in those days, I took a number of workshops. This is when I crawled out of COVID just a few months ago, and I went to Hot Springs, Arkansas on a water assignment. And um, this was a finalist in the IPA award. So, um, you know, it's just something I stay with. It has that, it has a sen sensual edge to it. This is not in the show, but I like being, you know, on this subject. And now we're gonna go to back to the show, next picture. So this is how the curators imagined my water pictures. Um, you see my, <clears throat> my overall body floating in vodka stein um, Austria, and then they chose a series of pictures that are from my water work on that wall. And then I have a multi, multi image projection on the floor, um, which I can't do here, but I'm going to now. Oh, next picture. I'm going to show you that the other view um, are the women that I shot for my two books. One is called Erotic Lives of Women and one is called Orgasm. And so they're all in this room. And now I'm gonna show you the pictures that are you know, molded together into an installation. Next picture. And these are all rather recent. Next picture. Next picture. That's the Dead Sea. Next, next picture. These are taken at Chico Hot Springs in 2019. Next picture. And that's uh, during COVID when nobody was swimming, a self-portrait. Next picture. That sounds like a great title. During COVID when nobody was swimming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that certainly was a difficult time, I think, and a time of going inside. Now, to bring you back to the show, um, I will stay on this picture. This is Abano. Isn't that an amazing, all those jacuzzis? But I met this woman, Marion Schneider, and um, we were both now getting older, and we were talking about <clears throat> issues of uh, diminishing sexual well-being. And we decided to collaborate on a book, which we called Erotic Lives of Women. We decided to ask women, what was your first erotic experience and can you show it to the camera and what was your strongest experience and can you show it to the camera so this put me now in the position of a portrait photographer and interpretive photographer so next picture I'm showing this, this is a picture of Annie Leibowitz because just while this was happening 
Jeannie Adams from Ansel Adams Gallery said, we're gonna have Annie Leibowitz for a workshop and we'd like you to be her private assistant. So I, I just couldn't resist that. So <clears throat> I got to spend five days with Annie and uh, you know she's all about the environment and of course celebrities, but the environment and finding things like that. So I learned a lot, but um, that really helped me when I photographed the women in the book, but for my self portrait, next picture, I made, I found the smallest thing I could find in Yosemite and made this self portrait that ends up to be the lead picture in my show. It's on color Polaroid X70, which I also added to my rituals of pictures. Okay, next picture. So <clears throat> Mary and I photographed women and interviewed them in many countries. And um, I got a book deal with uh, Scalo, a Swiss publisher. And so this is the cover picture. And um, next picture. The, the strongest experience of Maria, who happened to live at the Chelsea, so I had, I did a lot of that was like kind of a studio, but Maria's strongest experience was in, with a bondage experience. And uh, next picture. Her erotic fantasy were all these dildos and things, which is really funny when you think about it. If those of you who come to visit the Museum of Sex, today you can just buy a whole, a whole bundle of them. And back then, um, you know, it took extreme uh, sensitivity and looking to find such items that might thrill you. Next picture. Um, this is a self-portrait of uh, one of my strongest experiences. Next picture. This is <clears throat> Valerie. And Valerie, uh, one of the things we were revealing in this project is, especially with middle-aged women, is lo losing a sense of yourself. And so Valerie had had that happen to her and we met her and we, she said she wanted to talk about it and uh, that she had in fact expanded her erotic self. And this is her strongest erotic self because she had gained a lot of weight around her waist and didn't feel good about herself. And you know, the ideas I'm talking about now, um, you know, these were kind of new, newer back in the nineties when I was shooting this and next picture. And there's not enough time to talk about everything. So we'll go on to the next picture. So the good news is this: when this book came out, I got a call from the New York Times and an editor at the book review said, um, we got your book from your publisher and we're gonna take you to lunch. And so at lunch, they told me um, this Sunday, you're gonna be in the New York Times book review. Um, we sent it to Susie Bright and I called my publisher and. In, in Switzerland, it was like, I, I don't really think so. You know, I've never had a book reviewed. Yeah, sure enough, on that Sunday, for this book and this project to get these ideas out. Um, and so that helped me then to realize that I wanted, and Marion, that we wanted to go deeper into sexuality of women. And we came up to carry the theme and the style further with my book, Orgasm. Next picture. So <clears throat> Marion and I did the same idea. Here we were more interested in um, finding a, a deeper reason to um, find ways that women were choosing to go uh, against traditional taboos and to learn more about their bodies and to embody themselves more. And <clears throat> so we asked the same questions. What was your first orgasm? And when we say that, you know, it's fluid. It could be a little this way or that way, but generally women can arrive at that feeling. And what is your strongest orgasm? And can you show it for the camera? And then it was my creative idea with this project, because I used for the first time a digital camera to be able to ask the women to look at the pictures after we shot them and delete anything that didn't feel right to them because they were a participant 
much more in the project. And they wanted to be in the project. They wanted to speak about their bodies. So next picture. So to start it out, Marianne and I, Marianne took this picture of me and like really the strongest moment I knew I was having orgasms and not the sensations was when I experimented with pine needles as a child very often. And so what was interesting is we, like my first picture, I immediately didn't take off my clothes. You know, this was taking a different kind of look than uh, vaginal pictures and other things that, that had been done before about masturbation and these experiences. And then next picture, this is Marion. And for her, her strongest <clears throat> first experience was in college already. Um, she was stressed by making a decision about a man and about her thesis. And she went into the bathroom and started masturbating and had this her experience. So we recreated the pictures. Next picture. And this is um, Miss Amelia. And she said that her first experience of really having an orgasmic feelings was with the sheets, rough sheets, when her mom didn't iron them, you might say. Next picture. And this is um, Sophia, she's in the show. And for her, her strongest orgasm was um, the aphrodisiacness of sunshine. And uh, next picture. She came to the opening reception, um, one of our New York great event photographers and artists, Grace and Dantes, took this picture of her. She is now a professor in Berlin of literature and women's studies and film. And it was exciting because five women from these projects came back to the opening reception, which was October 17th. And um, next picture. So here we have um, Annie Sprinkles' first orgasm really orgasmic moment. And to recreate that for her, it was um, with a lovely man with a motorcycle that took her to the beach. And he had this soft kisses and things like that. So we, when she lives in San Francisco, we went over to the beach. Now these are recreations of moments, but <clears throat> the important thing I want to stress here um, is both making art and and making something uh, legacy lasting because this is the only thing so far that's been written with photographs around, around women, documentation of women's first of life. It's now in some special collections. So this makes me feel really good. Next picture. Yes. So we're coming to a point where you learned a little bit about the exhibition. You see it's this was at the opening night and uh, there's a picture of myself. And then behind me is Dragonfly who's in the picture of her with her strongest orgasmic experience and Emily Scheuer, uh, one of the curators. And um, I just wanna read you something by one of my colleagues in photography. Her name is Paula Allen and she's photographed in Cuba and Chile and um, someone I admire greatly. And I opened up my email the other day and she wrote, wrote to me, dearest Linda, uh, in your exhibit at the Museum of Sex, you have been photographing in the realm where sexuality is not something out of ourselves, but it is us. It is our desires, our imagination, our right. Seeing your work that spans so many years and is so gorgeously and lovingly presented is a pleasure. Photographs of pleasure presented in pleasure. So beautiful. Big congratulations. I would not have missed it. So um, that was really important. I already told you a little bit about Dragonfly there because I wanna just continue for a second. This gallery has become <clears throat> And this gallery of sex has become more and more meaningful and ha having better and better shows. And last year, the show was um, Betty Dodson. And Betty Dodson had a 50 year history of making sexual art and running masturbation workshops. And in, in the 90s or 2000, I 
tried to put my mother in this workshop. I paid for it and my mother did not go to it, but she received the uh, vibrator in the mail. And my mother used that vibrator till she was 89 years old when she passed away in a nursing home. And I think that is uh, like amazing that it follows me. Next picture. So um, what I wanted to say about making these erotic portraits is, you know, I need to feel goosebumps or catch a sensual moment. I, I look at everything. I look at sex, thoughts, emotions, clothing, color. Um, even today, after making images more than 50 years, the click of the shutter or the movement um, is a kind of behavior modification, if you will. So um, I will, I don't know, can I, oh yeah, this shows up. So this is my book, um, Orgasm. And um, next picture. This picture was taken by the woman you just saw, uh, Dr. Marina Masick. But on the back of my book, uh, Jerry Saltz, who's in the news a ton now, but he wrote for the back of my book, I firmly believe that women's mysteries, when explored by artists, will change the way the world looks and the way we look at the world. You all have the power. You only have to decide what to do with it. So in summing this up, for me, this project was a way to talk about aging justice, no shame in pleasure, expand your health so that you can be sexually active. And um, if you want to learn, if you can't get to this show in New York, closes on January 9th, um, you can go to my website, lindatroller.com and purchase a book or see more pictures. And you can ask me questions and I'm happy to have told you some of these stories, uh, the, a few of the back stories. As we do, first we applaud. Linda, that was beautiful. Thank you. Yay, Linda. <laughs> uh, in the uh, chat, Dee oh, said uh, the burn slide imagery is wonderful. And others commented uh, on that photo of the rock as well. Um, Olga Alexander says, I really like how they seem so authentic and not overly staged. Congratulations. You know, Linda, you very naturally, you gave a lot of personal information and you sort of explained your work to the point where I didn't have to ask any questions and open anything up. You know, you, uh, you know, often when I see work where women use their body, I'm sort of suspect, um, but you sort of uh, went beyond anything that I would be suspect of. You know, it was a very personal search what you do. You're obviously trying to break some social mores. You're, you're trying to bring conversations out that are literally hidden in the closet or in a box under the bed. Um, and yes, it's important when you did these works because you know pioneers like yourself have sort of pushed the bar forward and made it more accessible. Indeed, the Museum of Sex didn't exist 20 years ago and probably couldn't have existed. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you do something very important. When I asked you about where did you learn to photograph, because I sensed you both had, you both learned from doing, and yet you had too much technical skill to have just learned from doing. And so you really, you, you've got that mix. You know, sometimes academia can kill the artist. And in essence, it did not. It sort of enhanced your work. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I applaud you. Uh, it's very personal. Um, and, you know, your expression of what you did when you were younger and about your parents really explains why you're doing this work. And I think that's important. I think it's important for an artist to know why they're involved with their work. It's not enough just to say, uh, we're deforesting the land. I want to know why an artist is talking about the land. And you certainly expressed all of that from a very personal point of view. Um, both very beautiful photos and sort of socially important photos at the same time. 
So uh, I'm not surprised you're receiving success and you've had your book reviewed. You know how hard it is as a photographer, as a photographer, especially early on. Your subject matter, I, I would imagine people would balk at it and you would have uh, very little reception. Today, it's a different world. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes artists, it does take a lifetime for your art to get recognized and to be seen and uh, to get the proper exposure. I will add the SX-70 is my favorite of the Polaroids. That is a work of art in itself, that little machine. It's just so beautiful. And as far as what you can play with on the SX-70, do you still shoot? Do you still get film? Uh, I can. There is a place in, in uh, I believe, in the Netherlands that remakes those cameras and get Look. Getting... Look. I, I did not try that. It's not the same, you know. You can't manipulate it the same. Um, there was something I wanted to mention that, um, you know, I, I signed a book contract to do a self-portrait book and this Bryn Mawr show was supposed to be at Bryn Mawr about my self-portraits. So it's uh, coming out in 2023 with TBW Books will be a self-portrait book. The introduction is already there. And most of the layout has been, but the opportunity we have this feedback of having this show might, you know, inform the layout of the book that will come out next year. I had said to the publisher, well, if it doesn't come next year, I mean, everybody will have a self-portrait book. There won't be even space for this. But, um, you know, what I think we've learned is how much, um, even though they're selfies, but how much Self self introspection is so important to us. To our, you know, my I did it towards more uh, sexuality, but some people might do it towards their neurological health or their some other kind of health or communication. So um, yeah, these are all growing steps um, in my my future it's you know it's it's a very exciting you want a lot of things as you go along i'm very very happy to have had this opportunity to, and it's just you know opening up another layer nice to hear i will say uh, uh robert schaefer said great lecture linda you'd love to get a recording and yes this will be on my youtube which you can find the link for on my website as well i'll open it up uh to any other questions, I will say Olga Alexander asked, did any of the models ever suggest a pose you were not comfortable with? Linda? What? Did uh, any of the models ever suggest a pose you were not comfortable with? Oh, that's a very good question. Yes, I, yes, yes, I've had to push myself. Um, I, I always make myself very prepared, um, for my shoots in a lot of uh, ways with yoga or, or praying or pre preparing myself. But, um, there was, a, especially one woman, she's, she, uh, had her like slave, you know, in one of the picture, one of the picture with somebody she was beating, you know. That was really hard to, I, I made the picture, but we didn't, we came to a conclusion that we would, you know, where might we go from there? It was, uh, yes, I have been challenged. And maybe some of those challenges opened me up because uh, I had a show in Germany in 1970 and I was taking a group around and the group said, how can you talk about this? How can you have talked about this? And I thought, because I, you know, we have, like you said, let's not keep it in a shoebox. Uh, the French call uh, the orgasm, the le petit, the little deaths. And it's quite, quite fascinating. And uh, the little I know about it is uh, your brain does, is very active left and right side during an orgasm. And I would imagine that is healthy in itself. 
Yeah, there are, you know, there's lots of information on this. There are studies where they took people in into MRIs while they were masturbating. I, I don't know the results of that, but what <clears throat> the results I know is that um, when women, young women, look at the erotic book, they have no idea that it was not taken last year because people want to be in charge of themselves. They want to be stronger. They want to pre present them. You know, they want to meet people. They want something like that. The orgasm book is something else. It's, it's, it's something that we're still trying to, um, you know, find a place between boundaries and, you know, what is, what is acceptable and what we can extend. And I, I do think that um, the trans and the cross-dressing and the fluidity that has entered the culture since my book in 2014, um, it's very powerful and it's changing how we see each other. What do, what do you, do you agree? Yes, and I think it's happening much faster now. Um, uh, I think uh, in the past, uh, sexual awareness was a, a very slow curve, but now the way technology speeds up, I think, I think a lot is put in our face and we're evolving a lot quicker, understanding and being free but I, I will still say a lot of the things you're dealing with are still pushed under the covers. There's no question about it. Um, and so uh, it, it begs the question, why? I, I think in 1984, weren't they trying to eliminate, in George Orwell's book, eliminate the orgasm? Wasn't that part of it? A war against the orgasm? Because that was sort of the ultimate personal freedom and nonconformity to society. Let me open it up to any other questions or thoughts, or of course, you know, as we do it, if, if you just want to say anything positive to Linda, um, too often artists don't get told they're doing good or great work. And it's sort of nice when we hear people say that to one another. Um, uh, first of all, Linda, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I agree with Barry, it was wonderful to see all these different uh, periods and just the scope of what you're working on. But I want you to go back to that uh, point you were just making about this woman who was be being beaten or she was beating somebody. What I didn't hear exactly what you said. What what was going on there? You're challenged by some of the women that you photographed. And I said, yes, one woman uh, was a dominatrix. And um, when she you know, was going to have her whip or what, you know, some image she invited, she told me come to this address and we'll take the picture there. And she had, you know, a slave boy um, whipping him, he whipping, you know, that kind of situation. And I, you know, that was really shocking to me that I would take that picture. And um, yes, so that's what it was. It's, you know, especially in the 90s, dominant, a lot of women were dominatrixes for extra money or for careers in New York. Um, so, you know, the way we met people was generally, you know, I met this particular woman at my church. I went to Marble Church, which was the most open church in New York City, I guess. And we went to a Mary, Mother Mary workshop together and she said, she thought maybe I might like to do, to be a dominatrix. She, you know, she told me about what she did and stuff. And I said, well, would you like to be in my book? Because I'm looking for different women doing different things. But I, I had no idea the depth of the studio that we went to with, you know, what seems like nothing that recent movie, you know, about the sexuality, there's two movies out, I forget their names right now. Um, you know, that was uh, unknown to me, you know. Yeah, I see Shades of Grey, those movies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, we've already had that, you yeah. know, but we didn't have that vision 15 years ago. So it was quite surprising. That, yeah, that, I imagine that was, that would been very interesting. <laughs> the shock um, at that time. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for expounding because I 
Thank you for it kind of slipped by there and you said this. And I went, whoa, what is that little tidbit that she's mentioning there? So thank you. I was just curious. Um, hey, Linda, how are you doing? It's Daryl. Daryl. Hi. 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 So I was, well, first of all, I, I really appreciate your dialogue about all of this because this is something that I've always been really shy about, not necessarily behind closed doors, but in conversation and that sort of thing. But I guess uh, I was curious, um, was there a turning point where you saw or you thought, wow, like the public is becoming more receptive to my work because the kind of work sometimes people are doing, they feel this resistance, even if it's unspoken. And then little by little, they find, oh, they're actually entertaining this idea, this notion, they're paying attention. Was there sort of a defining you know, moment of that type or was it just sort of this gradual realization? For, um, you, for you, I mean. Well, uh, the book signing in 1998 was uh, at Rizzoli and it sold, the erotic class of women sold more books at one book signing than any book up until that time. It was the most exciting, you know, event. And then uh, my publisher was supposed, Scala was supposed to have a gallery in New York and I would be exhibited at this gallery. So that was the next thing, but that didn't happen in, in their plan. And then when I went around with the book, and small prints, I didn't find a gallery in New York. And they said that the women were, you know, like behind closed doors, these pictures are kind of, you know, gritty, they're not beautiful, they're not, they, you know, I have a picture, <clears throat> which I wanted to talk about. I photographed one woman, I think it was very erotic for her to, you know, like lean out the window with her boyfriend, you know, but be in the room or whatever. But a man would have photographed that, you know, she had her, her sweater sort of crooked, you know, it wasn't perfection of a, a, an objectified position, you know, and I think that, um, you know, people were still stuck in that for quite some years. So I did not have an exhibition of erotic lives of women in America um, for a long time. Uh, I had in fact, I had the biggest show of my life with 500 people in 19, in 2000, in 2000 at the uh, Photohof Gallery uh, of Erotic Lives of Women. It, it was where so is that, Where is that gallery? It was, it was in Europe. It was so crowded and so on it when it traveled everywhere. But I, I couldn't make that people respond to that, those pictures here. And um, things did start to change, um, you know, over the years. Um, and I did have a couple of shows with the orgasm work, although um, nothing like I would expect. Again, you know, people are looking for vaginas then, you know, it's not, these pictures really, um, they tread, they tread the taboo. And uh, so what you're saying is, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I luckily I have, you know, a, a couple of projects going like the rest of us. So, but yes, uh, today, and the most, one of the interesting things is one of the last people I photographed for orgasm book is I felt I had to have uh, a cross-dressing or a trans person who thought they were a woman or, or just call themselves a woman. And I photographed Danny from a, uh, in Berlin from a, a, a commune group called Fuck for Forest. And um, this is the only time this happened. Marion, uh, she lost the interview. I don't know. It just didn't work out. So I had the picture, it was getting near publication and she had to go back and interview him in Berlin and catch up. And my publisher said, you know, you only have one. What's the big deal? It's orgasm is about women. And I did not fight for that picture. I felt it coming 
and that you know he him her they us that even one was enough i just you know i didn't i was i was close but um you know you you grow with the work and and now that picture actually like the, on the opening night i a person immediately wanted to buy it immediately of Danny I would you know I put the things in the show that I weren't that I wasn't able to to include other places and um so I I know what you're talking about thanks how does this, does this relate to your work as well or to your personal life or how, how? to me yeah this um it's watching this progression yeah I think I think it's um in some ways it's really helpful because which is part of the idea, part of the purpose, the method for you, I think. But um, it's really helpful because it, you know, I mean, like Barry was saying, it sort of takes it out from underneath the cover and, you know, brings it out a little bit more into the open, doesn't make it so hush hush, you know, oh, we can't talk about that, you know, because it is sort of a normal part of life. And um, yeah, I find it really, really interesting. And I guess I'm always captivated also by things that are ideas expressed that are different than the status quo so yeah <laughs> and yours is certainly you know in that arena and uh did did you ever do a show where where you thought everything was great and then for some reason the like the powers that be just felt like it was too a little too much for them to handle regarding the sexuality part of it did you ever have that that problem or or generally when you knew you'd have a show, it, it went through appropriately. I never had that problem. Okay. You no. Know, um, maybe uh, things weren't presented on the wall as I might have imagined it, but um, you know, once a decision was made, I knew I was having that show. They were, you know, planned. Um, very planned and uh the show i was talking about that traveled around europe it's pretty interesting because they were blow-ups and they were on sprockets so they could travel they, you know they couldn't really be collected by somebody i mean they, would, they weren't really appropriate for collection but um <clears throat> that kind of shocked me when i arrived and and then we had to figure out how to put, it didn't seem to work perfectly. How do we put the sentence, that little bit of you know text I'm telling you, how do we put that with the pictures? And we just came up with this idea of fish line hanging down and a little closed piece of uh, recycled paper with just, you know, a, just a quote that was just enough to go with the sprocketed, you know, big blow ups that, I'm grateful for because so many people in Linz and all kinds of countries saw the work, um, but it was kind of, yeah. So that was kind of a shock. Um, but I, as I said, it was, um, it was grateful because just to have these kinds of pictures be accepted, you know, I've entered a lot of things where they don't get in, right? Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks a lot. Okay. I think once again, thank you, Linda. Thank yeah, you. that was beautiful. Thank you, Iris, for telling me about this group. Oh, very nice. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, special thanks, of course, to Linda for sharing such a cohesive presentation and to Michael Krasowitz, always helping out with technical things and sharing slides. And of course, FOMO or Mo Kelly, as I know her, for being the model for anybody who wanted to draw. If you'd like to contribute to Mo, you can reach out to me and I'll send or give you her information so you can. Uh, this is was taped. It'll be on the, my website and my YouTube channel if you'd like to check it out at a later date or spread the word about it. Next week, we have Bonnie Leibowitz presenting. We're coming towards the end of the year. Um, we'll probably have something interesting on the 27th. That's going to be the last presentation something a little more open, a little more informal. Um, any ideas, reach out to me um, and we'll put something together that's uh, interesting. 
Thanks again, Linda. You were great. It's nice to see an artist who really knows her stuff. You're very confident in what you do. And at the same time, you're still evolving at the age of 22. It's very nice <laughs> to see. Um, and uh, I think that's part of what keeps us going as artists, always evolving, always searching. Um, even though your body is, of work is very cohesive from your early photographs to now, uh, certainly the presentation at the Museum of Sex is quite a sharp presentation. The, uh, the four or five pieces on one large piece, the banner hanging, that was a very smart, it was a very smart uh, presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. You. Great, great questions by everybody. Thanks so much. Nice to see so many friends so regularly. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Barry. Good night, everyone. Good night.